1115 waiver. I'm Rebecca Donnell. I'm the deputy for the 1115 waiver project, and I'll be facilitating today. Um, we're going to get started uh, with the presentation here in a second, but before we do, I'm going to go over a few housekeeping items, uh, logistical um, information for you. Uh, we expect a pretty large group today. We had more than 375 people register for the webinar, which is fantastic. We're thrilled about that. Um, but it's important with a group this large that everybody put themselves on mute when they're not speaking. So if you haven't done that at this point, please go ahead and um, put yourselves on mute. So uh, we don't hear background noise and all that kind of jazz um, throughout the presentation. Um, the second item on our housekeeping list is we're recording the meeting. Um, and so we'll put that recording um, up on the website, the waiver website, and we'll make that website uh, address available to you uh, on the last slide of the presentation today. So you can go uh, re-listen to the webinar or invite other people who weren't able to join us today to listen um, in on the information. If you're able to, you can update your Zoom profile with your name and the organization where you're with. That's helpful um, in the question and answer portion of the meeting. Also, when we're doing question and answer, uh, please raise your hand with the Zoom function for raising your hand under the reactions uh, option in Zoom. Uh, so you can be recognized uh, that you'd like to ask a question. Um, and state your name when you do get called on to ask a question so uh, we know who we're talking to. Um, you're welcome to put questions in the chat also throughout the presentation. We'll have someone who is monitoring the chat and answering questions that they can in real time. We'll also be sure to um, go through those questions that are entered into the chat and answer um, ones that we think are appropriate for everyone to hear about. Um, closed captioning is available to access closed captions link on the live transcript, transcript button on your Zoom toolbar. Also language interpretation is, is available to access the interpretation services. Click on the interpretation button on your Zoom toolbar and select your desired language. Um, We'll have several breaks throughout the presentation where you can ask questions. We'll have um, some nice intermissions for Q&A. And so please hold your questions or put them in the chat during that time. Again, we'll have someone monitoring the chat and answering questions throughout. So with that, uh, I think we're ready to get started. Uh, Lori, are you on? I think Lori is on, but um, let me do an overview of Lori Coiner, our presenter for today. Um, Lori is currently serving the Oregon Health Authority as the Senior Medicaid Policy Advisor, and for the last 18 months has been overseeing the Oregon 1115 Demonstrator Waiver Request with the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid. Um, She's been working on the waiver and ensuring that the focus is on improving health equity, the social determinants of health, and better and broader access to Medicaid coverage. Lori also served as the Medicaid director uh, for Oregon Health Authority. She oversaw Oregon's Medicaid program, which covers more than a million Oregonians through our coordinated care organization system, uh, the 15 CCOs in our various service areas across the state. And so with that, I will hand it over to Lori to share with us this wonderful presentation on the waiver renewal, what it means for Oregon and the Oregon Health Plan.
I think maybe Lori is maybe uh, running a little bit late, so I'm going to get us started. Again, if you have uh, any questions throughout uh, the presentation, please put them in the chat. Make sure you're on mute. And for those that joined a little bit later, we are recording this session so that we can put it up on the waiver renewal website. So the first thing we're going to talk about today is what is Medicaid and the Oregon Health Plan. Medicaid is a federal program that is administered by each state. In Oregon, our Medicaid program is called the Oregon Health Plan. Some other states call their Medicaid program um, other names. We each have customized programs for our, our, our states. Coordinated care organizations are the local Oregon Health Plan delivery system that cover the medical, dental, and mental health care. More than one in four people in Oregon get their health care coverage through the Oregon Health Plan. So the next question is, what's a waiver? People are eligible for the Oregon Health Plan based on their income and for other eligibility reasons. The federal government sets rules and sets minimum standards related to eligibility and the requirements for the Medicaid programs and their benefits. But states can ask to waive some of the federal rule to gain more flexibility in offering their state Medicaid program. For us, that's the Oregon Health Plan. It allows us to cover more people and also to cover more services than are usually allowed uh, with the standard Medicaid um, program outlined by the federal government. So every, every five years, Oregon needs to renew its agreement with the federal government around the Oregon Health Plan. We do this through the 1115 waiver. In the 1115 waiver, we propose new changes um, for new programs that we want to offer to our members. Um, and we also uh, ask to continue to offer existing programs that we've um, put into place through previous waivers. And the federal government can say yes, or they can say maybe not to our proposals and what we're trying to accomplish in Oregon. And that is the waiver process. And so we've been going through the waiver process over the last 18 months. Uh, we developed several concepts that we submitted to the Centers for Medicaid and Medicare at the federal government. Um, and then we put them into an application. I should say we developed the concepts, got feedback, and then put them into the formal application to CMS and have been going through the process of working through um, our application with CMS to gain authorities, gain approval for the concepts that we included and submitted to the federal government in our 1115 waiver. Our primary goal for this waiver is advancing health equity. And within that main goal, we have four sub goals. We want to ensure that people can maintain their healthcare coverage so that they're not rolling on and rolling off, that they're not experiencing disruption in their healthcare coverage. We want to make sure that we're improving health outcomes by addressing social needs that impact health. So we know that social needs impact our health as much as um, medical needs, for instance. And so we want to make sure that we're addressing whole health and what people need to remain healthy. Um, so the social determinants of health is a big piece of what we're trying to do. Ensuring smart, flexible spending for health equity. 
So thinking um, differently about how we use our Medicaid dollars um, so that we can reach our goals towards health equity and creating a more equitable, culturally and linguistically responsive healthcare system. So we wanna make sure that we are thinking about working towards and systematically improving our healthcare system to be more responsive to our membership, to our OHP members. I'm pausing here. I see Lori has joined. Uh, I'm gonna hand it over to Lori, um, who has led our waiver process uh, for the last several months and um, is our presenter for today. Good afternoon, everyone. This is Lori Coiner, and I apologize for being late. I was in another presentation and got delayed. So um, thank you so much, Rebecca, for um, taking over and getting start, getting us started. Um, and as Rebecca said, I'm the um, Senior Medicaid Policy Advisor for the Health Authority. I've been the Medicaid Director a couple of times before that and spent the last year and a half working on the waiver uh, with, with the waiver team, uh, which includes Rebecca. So I wanna thank her for stepping in. Um, so this part of the presentation, I'm gonna talk about the policies that we, the more specifics. So Rebecca started by letting folks know, for those of you that don't, you know, what a waiver is and why it's important. And then, you know, our big goals. So like um, she mentioned, the overarching goal for our waiver is um, to um, eliminate health inequities or improve health, health equity across the state. And um, so I'm going to talk about the things that um, the federal government or the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services, CMS, um, approved for us. And then we're going to talk a little bit about um, what they didn't approve and what we still have on the table and um, next steps. So um, I'm going to start with access. And you know, one of the really important things that we've learned during the pandemic is, um, well, let me back up. During the pandemic over the last couple of years, um, Medicaid programs across the country have been keeping people on Medicaid. Um, so a person will not lose their Oregon Health Plan insurance if they uh, fail to respond to paperwork, if um, for other reasons, the only reasons that someone will be disenrolled from the Oregon Health Plan is if they move out of state and let us know um, if they pass away or if um, they let us know that they have uh, commercial or some other insurance. And what we've learned is by doing this, um, we've decreased the uninsured insurance rate for many people in Oregon and particularly folks of color. Um, so we know that African Americans in Oregon have um, more are more likely to be insured than ever before during the pandemic, and part of that is uh, for something that we call churn. And what that means is that uh, we have people on the Oregon Health Plan; they lose their coverage and then come back in a short time, maybe within six months to a year. Uh, sometimes that's because they made a little too much money one month. Sometimes that's because um, paperwork didn't come in or, or other reasons like that. So what we've asked, uh, what we had included in the waiver was um, continuous enrollment that would help for those um, folks that come on and off to stay on. And, um, and I'll talk a little bit about why that's important. So the first one um, is a really big deal. Um, it, it's the first, for both of these, we're the first state in that whole country to have these authorities. Um, the first one is that kids can stay enrolled until their sixth birthday. 
So what that means is if um, a baby is born and they are can be covered on the Oregon Health Plan, they can stay on all the way until their sixth birthday without having to um, do another income verification or um, or things like that. Now we will be asking members to update their address, update their income, but they won't lose. Um, those children will not lose coverage during that time. If they come on when they're age two, they get to stay on until they're six. Um, the reason that's important is um, kids start kindergarten when they're um, six years old. And so this allows children to maintain their health care coverage across all those early years of development. Um, and and um, that way they can make all, you know, make sure they have all their well child, child visits or any developmental delays are discovered and treated. The other um, um, authority that we got is for any person who is covered Hello. by the Oregon Health Plan, um, age six and up, they stay on. on for two years. Hold on a second. I think we need somebody to put themselves on mute. Um, yes, so there is a question about siblings between six and 25. Um, if they are between six and 25, they would stay on for the two years. Um, these will start after the pandemic. So what that means is that um, once the public health emergency ends, everybody that's enrolled in Medicaid has to go through a redetermination or re needs to have their um, eligibility checked. Once for kids, once that eligibility is checked then and they meet, they still are um, Medicaid eligible, they will stay on until their sixth birthday or for kids up to age 18, um, they would stay on for two years. For anyone over age 18, they will, um, that continuous coverage will start sometime after July, 2023. So it sort of depends when the, um, when the public health emergency ends. Um, the other thing I'll mention here, because I think it was addressed in one of the questions, um, this applies to all populate all Medicaid populations, um, with the exception of one, and um, they're called the 217 population. They are folks who are covered through um, Oregon Department of Human Services, and they have to receive a um, annual assessment to determine their benefits through um, another type of waiver. And we didn't want those folks to miss having their annual assessment so and, and miss out on services. So they have to reapply every year. Um, next slide. I'm gonna pause. Oh, I'm gonna talk a little bit here. I, I already did, but um, about what this means for our Oregon Health Plan members, and then we'll we'll take questions on this topic. So, like I mentioned, it allows people to stay covered longer. Um, there's less time that needs to be spent in re-enrolling, um, and that the the people won't lose coverage for um, because of short-term changes, like, oh, made too much money a couple of months and then um, you know are eligible again. So it should smooth out those times that people, um, for reasons that people lose coverage. So I'm going to pause there and turn it over to Rebecca to monitor questions. Okay, so you can put your questions in the chat or you can uh, raise your hand and we will call on you. There's the question, Lori, does the automatic enrollment continue if someone is jailed? Yes, so, well, sort of. <laughs> so what happens is if somebody comes on with a continuous enrollment and let's say after six months, they're jailed for six months. Um, so if they're incarcerated for six months, that they, um, as many of you know, Medicaid benefits are frozen. Um, when they come back on, then they would have another year. So they 
their continuous eligibility would continue um, for if they, let's say they had were covered for six months, incarcerated for six months, then they'd have another year. Um, so it works that way. Um, some other questions. If a seven-year-old reapplies for OHP and is over income and she or he has a three-year-old on OHP, would the three-year-old continue on OHP, but the seven-year-old would not qualify? That's right. So if there's a three-year-old, they will stay on until their sixth birthday. Other uh, members of the family then stay on, have to have their income checked every two years. Thanks, Lori. There's another question. Uh, which program is the one that still requires annual assessment? It's called 217, and I'd have to look that up. Um, I don't know the name, the name of the program beyond that. We, we'll, we can um, get back. Might be able to have somebody look that up while we're talking. Okay, um, I think we're ready to go to the next section, Lori, if you're ready. Okay. Um, the next topic uh, that we're going to talk about are health related social needs. And I think Rebecca um, um, probably mentioned these and why they're important. Um, so we did ask the federal government for coverage of housing and nutrition uh, with the belief that a person can't be meet their uh, medical need, have their medical needs met and get healthy if they don't at least have some stable housing and, and good and um, are not hungry. Um, and so we did ask for those services, but not for, I want to stress these aren't for every single um, Medicaid beneficiary or any for all members on the Oregon Health Plan. We really focused on people who are in transition. And what that means is that they're transitioning in some way in their life. It can be um, an age-related thing. It can be um, some other situation in their life where they typically lose Medicaid membership. And, they and, and there are also people who are typically battling homelessness or um, you know, lack of, of social needs or have a higher level of social need. So I'm going to walk through these different um, transition groups who qualify. The, the social needs that we got approved are um, include housing services and nutrition services. And I'm going to talk about those in more detail in just a minute. So the housing and nutrition services will be available for youth with special health care needs. Um, we created a new eligibility category for youth who um, either have chronic conditions or mental, which includes mental health conditions um, when they're aging out of the child benefit. So they're, they turn um, 19, they can qualify um, if they have these conditions for coverage up to 300% of poverty until they're age 26. Uh, they will also um, qualify. So then in that time when they're 19 to 26, if they're in this group, they will have the child benefit all the way till 26. So they'll have um, expanded vision and expanded dental. Um, also, they will have early periodic screening diagnosis and treatment services or EPSDT, which we're providing, we will be providing starting the beginning of this year across all of um, the kids on OHP. Um, they, so they will qualify as well for um, rental assistance if they're homeless, um, utility assistance, and other types of housing and nutrition services. The, another set of youth are kids who are child welfare involved. Um, and this includes kids who are leaving, aging out of foster care. Um, I just heard a presentation by a CCO who's been doing some piloting on this, and they're finding that about half of kids who leave foster care need assistance with housing. So it's a real need. Um, it's, it's, I think, heartbreaking in some regards and also warm, you know, feel we feel like we're um, going to be able to help kids who are really in need here. Um, people who are experiencing homelessness or at risk of homelessness, 
uh, older adults who have Medicaid and then they're aging into me to Medicare. So they'd have Medicare and Medicaid or what we call dual eligibility. Um, people being released from custody, meaning people leaving, um, and that's both adults and youth leaving um, the Department of Corrections, the Oregon Youth Authority or local jails or uh, juvenile facilities. And then people at re risk of extreme weather events due to climate change will be eligible for um, some climate change uh, um, services that I'll talk about in a minute. Uh, another important thing to note is it's going to take us a year to get this program going. Um, so these benefits will be available um, starting on January 1st, 2024. We may also be rolling out just some of these benefits at the beginning of 2024 and then um, adding services across that year or and, and uh, beyond. Uh, it's going to take a lot of work. We have to work with our housing providers um, and the CCOs um, in terms of, you know, None of us have worked in that healthcare system have worked in housing. And so there's lots of connections that need to be made to be able to provide these services to our members. Next slide. And what this means for um, OHP members that, you know, the, these new services, so the housing services and nutrition services are considered a Medicaid benefit by, by CMS and by the state. And what that means is that um, for those of you who um, have experienced our health related services, they can vary by CCO. So one CCO may cover one thing and another doesn't because those are what we call discretionary services or the CCOs are allowed to decide what they're gonna pay for on health related services. These new services are considered benefits. So they there will be much more um, consistency between CCOs in terms of what, what folks can um, be eligible for and what services they can receive. Um, next slide. So in terms of housing, um, there are six months of rental assistance or temporary housing. And that's actual rent payments and rent deposits um, for people who have medical need or are homeless. Um, also, for those for those folks who are receiving temporary rental assistance, they can also receive six up to six months of utility assistance. Um, the utility assistance won't be applied for anybody, just those that are getting the um, rental assistance. Um, there is home one-time home modifications that will be available, such as ramps or handrails to help people be safer in their homes or be able to stay um, living in their home. Um, what we call pre-tenancy and tenancy support services. So those are things like um, helping folks fill out rental applications, helping people get an ID so they can uh, apply for um, a place to live. Um, helping with moving expenses, um, furniture, food in the fridge um, once they move in. And then housing focused navigation or a case manager who helps the member uh, you know, find these services and make sure they, they happen. Next slide. So for nutrition services, one of the pieces will be to have a navigator help that person um, or people or families um, make sure that they are um, receiving re community-based services like SNAP and WIC. Um, so um, other federal programs that provide food. There's also for people who meet medical need, uh, there will be nutrition and cooking, um, education, um, fruit and vegetable prescriptions for people, for kids and pregnant women. Um, healthy food boxes and meals that can last up to six months, and then um, med medically tailored meal delivery for up to six months for people who have conditions like diabetes where they need a special diet. Next slide. I, I mentioned a little earlier that I talk about um, climate, and um, so we um, in cases of a climate emergency that is declared by the federal government or by our governor, 
So things like wildfires, um, that heat dome that we had a couple of years ago that happened in Portland, um, extreme cold, that uh, people will be eligible for devices that help them maintain healthy temperatures. So heaters, air conditioners, and also people who have a medical necessity for clean air. So um, air filters, for example, and then also generators to operate medical devices like ventilators, or if a person is on, on a C, has a CPAP machine at home, those sorts of things uh, for when power outages happen. Next slide. Um, so what this means is that we, you know, people can still receive services through health related services, but for those folks in transition, the housing, the housing and nutrition services I just outlined would be available, um, and as a covered benefit. Um, that means that everyone who qualifies for the benefit, um, has the opportunity to receive it. And that, that way that people who are experiencing um, certain life challenges will have extra help uh, meeting their social needs so that they can stay healthy and um, kind of get their lives on track, which can't happen when a person is struggling just with the basic needs. Next slide. Uh, this slide just shows a little bit, I, we've had some questions about how the health-related social needs fits with um, our health-related services or flexible services. So um, the big blue box is all CC, or the big blue circle is all CCO members. And when you think about all CCO members, that they have the opportunity to qualify for flexible services or re and request those from a CCO. The, orange, the smaller orange circle is the people in transition, the transition populations I outlined, and they are that's the group that's eligible for the health related social needs services. So um, just wanted to show that not everyone, you know, it would qualify for health related social needs and also that our health related services and flexible services aren't going away. Next slide. The final thing I want to mention before I, I think we'll have some time for questions is that um, if you take a look at what all of the pieces that we um, put together here in the waiver, and when we think about equity, we focused um, on kids and we focused on kids who are um, have certain um, extraordinary need. So for example, we will be providing continuous coverage for the really young kids up to age six. Um, we also will removed our waiver of early periodic screening diagnosis and treatment for kids up to 21. What does that mean in plain English? That means that um, we used to have a waiver that allowed um, CCOs to not cover certain services for kids if they fell below the line of our benefit package or our prioritized list. Um, that was allowed through our waiver and we are no longer, um, we no, no longer have that in our waivers. So now um, CCOs and our open card program will need to cover all services for children that their physician considers is medically necessary. Um, so that expands services for kids um, like I mentioned earlier, we have youth with special health care needs now um, will have coverage all the way until their age 26 and um, the health related social needs will will be available for those youth with special health care needs. Um, I think it's important to note that that includes kids with me um, mental health issues and we know that's a real problem for many um, kids in our state and then um, children who are child welfare involved and youth involved in the criminal justice system. Next slide. Um, I mentioned prioritized list and I wanted to bring this up. Um, so we have a, the way that Oregon manages our benefit packages for the Oregon health plan is, is through what's called the prioritized list. We have a um, open, transparent, process. Um, we have a, a commission called the um, Health Evidence Review Commission, or 
Sometimes you might hear it called the HERC. And the HERC gets together and looks at evidence around various treatments and how they relate to different conditions that people might have. And we um, make sure that those that are the most effective are funded. There's some, so there are some services that fall below the line that we don't pay for with um, the Oregon Health Plan. Um, we are moving that, th that authority or the ability to have the prioritized list from our waiver to what's called a state plan amendment. And really what this means is that it's um, going to be more permanently part of how we manage our benefit package. So um, this won't uh, doesn't happen until January of 2027. And from a member perspective, you really won't see changes in how um, uh, benefits are provided for adults. Um, like I mentioned, for kids, there, there are some expanded services that now are covered. Next slide. We also, I think I saw in the, some of the chat, we're scrolling by, somebody said, how are these services funded? So we did ask the federal government for extra money. Um, and there's a program called the State Designated Health Programs. Um, we call it DISH-B often. Um, and it's a special program for where the feds, federal government can provide states extra dollars um, for programs that, they, that the administration feels are important. Um, and so we were able to secure an extra billion dollars for Oregon to cover these housing services and the nutrition services and the coverage for kids with special health care needs or youth with special health care needs. Um, this funding lasts uh, for the whole period of the waiver. So the federal dollars will pay for um, the health related social needs for years two, three, and four of the waiver. The first year we, uh, we will be spending dollars to get our system set up. And then the last year of the waiver, um, we take it over, the state does. Um, and, and after the waiver, we'll continue to cover the, the services um, as part of our state plan. Next slide. Okay, I'm gonna stop. I see there's been lots of comments in the chat and I'm gonna turn it over to Rebecca um, to, yeah, Lori, we've had a lot of comments in the chat. Um, a couple of them around workforce and um, things like housing availability. Can you talk a little bit about um, DISHB, the funding, how the capacity building that's part of the plan? Talk a little bit about that. Yeah, so um, first thing is the DISHB dollars cannot be used to build housing. Um, and it, it says that sp expressly in our waiver. Um, and the reason is that the federal government, um, you know, these dollars come from Medicaid and um, the federal government has other ways to pay for permanent um, housing and housing and building housing. And that's through um, HUD and other, other federal programs. So um, what, what needs to happen, and you'll notice that the housing services that we're gonna be covering here are um, just temporary housing. So the, the goal and the purpose for, um, let me give an example that, that um, I just heard from HealthShare. So HealthShare of Oregon has been piloting this, um, a similar program for the last year. And um, um, if you, when they worked with um, foster youth, who are youth who are leaving the foster system. What, what happens is there are vouchers, housing vouchers available for those youth. Um, and they come through the Department of Human Services. Uh, so what the housing services that we're gonna provide can help with is that youth gets a voucher, they get a place to live, but they don't have furniture. They don't have, know how to um, manage their uh, tenancy meaning stay in that housing. And so we are, we will be able, Medicaid would be able to provide um, housing supports, fill the fridge, help the, that youth get furniture and those sorts of things. Um, and, and they get the voucher through a permanent federal program. We've been talking lots to um, the, and a partner are partnering with Oregon, um, Housing and Community Services 
so that we can, again, provide temporary housing so that people have a chance then to start working to find permanent housing or vouchers. So this is not going to solve the homeless problem. I, it's not going to provide housing to everyone on the Oregon Health Plan, but it is going to be a, an important bridge for people who are um, in transition to help them find permanent housing. Um, the One of the reasons that we aren't providing these services until um, January of 2024, and I think this has come up a lot in the chat, is that um, the CCOs need time to build their networks. And what that means is starting to work with housing providers and help um, because uh, those housing providers will be key in providing some case navigation services and providing um, you know, housing services to members. Um, HealthShare has had lots of experience in doing this. Um, that means that also there needs to be new ways to think about how to pay for those services. Um, I think that's gonna be evolving over time. And in this first year, in many cases, it will involve invoicing. So the housing providers would you know, be paid for the service, um, but that's new for many and many are small. And so we know it's gonna take some serious work to build those resources and networks uh, between the CCOs and the housing providers. The other thing is that I'm gonna say up front, we don't have a lot of this sorted out. And I know that many of you are involved right in the details. Um, we're hoping to get lots of you know, feedback around implementing because um, we just got these services approved. And so we don't have the answers yet, which is what is gonna be happening over the next 14 months in terms of um, you know, answering questions around navigation, um, we do recognize that there is a lack of permanent housing and that's gonna be something that we're gonna have to address together and collectively. Um, the other piece is, um, you know, and also just developing the, the linkages uh, between, for example, um, the CCOs and the different resources that who can offer service. Thanks, Laurie. I think you answered a lot of questions. One of them um, um, that was unique that I'm not sure that came up in your answer was, will Callum members be able to obtain these services? So Callum, Callum members will if they fall within the transition groups. Um, so, but not if, yeah. So that, that's my answer. The, um, the Callum members will, will be covered under the continuous enrollment. Okay, I think we're ready to, we'll have, quest, we'll have time for more questions uh, later on. We're just kind of briefly pausing throughout um, to answer as many as we can um, during these breaks. So I think we'll get started again, Lori, and then we'll have a, a longer question and answer period at the end. Great. Okay, let's move on. So this last little bit, I'm gonna talk about the next steps and can, what's happening next. <laughs> so first off, we had lots of requests in our waiver and there are some things that um, the federal government or CMS told us um, we can't get all negotiated before the end of September, but we still wanna talk about. And there are some things that we either, we took off the table or the federal government did. So here's the list of things that, that we um, did not include in our final waiver package and we will not be talking about in the near future. So one is um, some rate setting flexibilities for CCOs. Well, you may have heard this is uh, called global budgets for CCOs. Uh, the other, were, we had asked for some flexibilities around pharmacy. Um, and that was really aimed at reducing pharmacy costs for Medicaid. Um, we won't be um, talking about those. Uh, we had requested and expedited a, method, a way to um, allow people who are on SNAP um, to also quickly become Medicaid enrolled. Uh, there's ways to do that through what's called the state plan amendment, so it's not included in the waiver. We, um, as part of our health related social needs, we'd asked for employment and transportation benefits. Those, um, um, CMS was not ready to talk about those. I think 
sometime in the future that may happen, but I, you know, we also re recognized that the housing and nutrition is a heavy lift for us to get off the ground and we uh, have lots on our plate to focus on those first. And then finally, um, we did ask for some uh, coverage for peer delivered services. Um, so peer wellness, we asked that peer wellness specialists and peer um, support specialists could work outside of a care plan for uh, people who are receiving behavioral health services so that they can um, assist a member. For example, if they come out of um, an SUD treatment, a substance use disorder treatment, and they still want um, a peer to be able to meet with them on a regular basis, that that can happen, um, even if it's not in the care plan. Um, after conversations with CMS, we found out that we can do this with a spa. So that's gonna be happening um, through what's called, again, a state plan amendment, and we didn't need to include it in the waiver. Next slide. Um, there are four things that we are continuing to talk to CMS about. Um, so we worked with our nine tribes. Um, we will be requesting um, some sp specific tribal requests. That's going to start here in the next week or two. Um, we will be talking to CMS about those. Um, also, I think there's there were quite a few custody questions, and so I, I can sort of answer those with this. Um, we can cover the housing and nutrition services for folks leaving corrections. Um, there still is a requirement that their Medicaid benefit is suspended while they're incarcerated. Uh, so we won't be able to do inreach, for example, into the correction system and work with members before they leave, which is gonna make things harder. So we are asking for coverage, uh, a limited benefit coverage for people in custody, including, well, people in custody um, before they leave so that those service, so, so that, you know, we can start to um, help them schedule and prepare um, their, for their exit with um, health related social needs and with um, any medical or behavioral health or dental services they need. This is, we also have this request for people leaving state hospital. Um, so that's a kind of a separate request, but it, it's really for the same reasons. So that, um, you know, a, a care coordinator um, or a navigator can come in and meet with the person before, before they leave and help start to um, schedule appointments and things like that. Provide med uh, med medicines so that when the person walks out the door, they have uh, you know three months of uh, whatever medications they need and, and those sorts of things. The final thing that we did not get um, fully discussed and approved by CMS are something called community investment collaboratives. Um, these we had asked for extra federal money to fund local um, collaboratives that would focus on improving health equity in their community. Um, we still plan to have those conversations. And um, again, we need more work, um, mostly around what those funds can be used for and not used for when in terms of you know, improving health equity and also um, accountabilities or what kinds of things do we need to measure to show that the money's being spent in a way that's effective. Next slide. Um, here, just wanted to let folks know that we've been um, meeting with lots of people. I'm really excited. We have, looks like we have over 200 participants today. Uh, but we've been, um, this shows the various um, presentations that either I or our waiver team have made um, anywhere from the Oregon Health Policy Board, legislators, um, the community, um, uh, our community partners, this waiver days, um, some national webinars too. Uh, people all over the country are really interested in the work. And so um, wanted to share with folks, in, in, also our internal staff. We have a community, community partner um, webinar tomorrow in Spanish. Uh, it's all completely in Spanish language. And then um, we'll be meeting with the Medicaid Advisory Committee tomorrow as well. Next slide. 
So I am done with my presenting. I am going to turn this over to Rebecca to help with some questions. I do want to mention here, you know, it says, how do we meaningfully engage OHP members um, and community partners to across 2023? So i um, happy to answer specific questions. Like I mentioned, we're still building this program. Um, and at some I think important intersections across the, the coming months, it will be important to receive feedback from um, both our members themselves and people who work directly with our members and our uh, community benefit organizations and how to make all this success, all this successful for our members. So thank you. Thank you so much, Lori. Um, yeah, so our question, we're gonna open it up and, and have a longer session of Q and A. Um, it can be specific questions around um, what Lori shared in terms of the new benefits. It can be how we're engaging with our communities um, to hear more about what's needed um, or uh, questions around when these will be benefits will be available, et cetera. Any questions? I see Hillary Nichols um, has their hand up. Yeah. Hi, can you hear me? Yep. Yeah, we can hear you. Okay, super. Um, hi, everyone. And hi, Lori. We met a couple of maybe months ago at this point. Um, I'm the health equity organizer at Richmond and uh, working with the healer health equity and leadership at Richmond. We had a couple of folks with lived experience um, share their story as well. Um, of course, as we talked about last time, I'm really interested about that piece of the continued negotiations around um, OHP coverage before people leave custody. And we actually had um, a number of research slash action meetings with um, uh, legislative staffers from uh, Senator Merkley's office, Senator Wyden's office, and Representative Blumenauer's office. And we wanted to know kind of from that level, um, we were lucky to get those yeah. meetings with them. Um, you know, what's what's the deal? Why why hasn't CMS approved these pieces? What's, you know, what's going on with the Medicaid Reentry Act? And it was really interesting because we got um, kind of two different messages around the um, CMS uh, approving those parts of our waiver. And one uh, one staffer said, oh, you know, they're, they're probably going to provide that national guidance because um, we know that 10 other, you know, about 10 other states um, submitted similar proposals. Uh, anyway, information from that staffer that said, you know, they're probably going to, you know, provide national guidance in, in the positive and we're just waiting for that to happen. Um, and another staffer um, from a different office said um, they might feel like their hands are tied because of uh, because of where the Medicaid Reentry Act um, of 2021 is and feel like, well, we can't say yes to this piece until something like that is passed. Um, so it's kind of up to Congress to do their job. Um, um, as it stands on uh, October 25th today, like what, what's the update on yeah. um, why it hasn't or why it's still in negotiation and, and it, is it looking sort of on the positive, like it is going to happen and they're just being really careful about how they want to communicate that information or do you get the sense that um, it might not happen this year and we might have to sort of go back to the drawing board. Yeah, no, um, really good question. So it it's likely not going to happen this year for us. Um, I think that the there's some congressional work that needs to happen. Um, you are right, 10 states have asked. Um, I do believe I heard from high up that um, you know, California has been meeting with um, CMS across the last year on a regular basis on this topic. California is likely going to receive approval before the end of the year. Um, and their request is very similar to ours in terms of covering people who are justice involved uh, before they leave. Um, and then we expect guidance to come out about that time. Um, we are, like I mentioned, we're starting negotiations again with um, CMS on the tribal request, but um, they also indicated that we, we can start talking about the justice involved request with like soon. 
So that's really positive. I think that we will have something in hand sometime in 2023. I, um, and, and, quite likely at towards the where we're going to work really hard to have that happen at the towards the beginning of 2023. Uh, we're going to look to model as much as we can after California it will make the approval process a lot similar, but we want to make sure it meets Oregon's needs. So that's where we are. So thanks for that question. Yeah, thanks, Hillary. Uh, Lori, there's a question just around the state plan amendments and the mm -hmm. work that will be moving forward. Is there any timeline for that? No, I don't have the I don't have the timelines in front of me. Um, the work is underway, uh, at least on the behavioral health, the peer wellness specialists and peer support specialists. Um, I don't know the timeline offhand, but it's um, there have been meetings and the the state plan amendments being drafted, and that's a much easier process to get an approval from CMS than going through a waiver. We make state plan amendment changes. Um, most every month, <laughs> so. Okay, all right, so there's a there's a pathway for that. Another great question, Lori, um, how many people do, you, do we know will be impacted by these benefits? What are the estimates? You know, I don't have those numbers in front of me, frankly. I, it, we know that there are, for you know, many homeless individuals in the state, for example. Um, I think for criminal justice, it's it's probably about a thousand people a year. Um, you know, foster kids, it's much lower. Um, I think what when we talk about you know homeless population that's covered under OHP, it's probably something on the order of you know, there's thousands of people. Um, that's what I'll, I can I can provide that level of specificity at this point. Okay, um, Lori, there's a question about CCO involvement in these new benefits and the rollout. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, I think, you know, that's still coming together. So the CCOs will be paid. So for the first years, um, the CCOs, the, the funding for this will go to CCOs and then CCOs will pay providers, uh, you know, housing providers and navigators and nutrition providers. Um, for the services. Uh, you know, the way to think about this is um, CCOs pay for someone to have, um, you know, diabetes prevention um, um, services, and they pay providers for that. And now these housing benefits and nutrition benefits are, are, are like a medical benefit. And so they will go through the CCOs. Um, people on open card will also be eligible for these benefits, and we will be working on that as well. Um, and tribal folks. So um, yes, Jim, um, the fee for service clients will will also who are you know meet the transition population um, definitions will uh, also have access to the services. And lots of work needs to be done on how that's going to happen. So there's I'm, I apologize, I don't have answers to many of the really great specific questions that have been coming through. Yeah, so let's pause for a second. And um, there are a lot of questions in the chat that are really specific and um, we'll take all of these questions and we'll um, try to answer them as best we can uh, after the meeting. Some of them are really specific that we're gonna have to gather the information and um, get back to like the exact number of folks that this is going to impact. We have those numbers um, and we can certainly answer that question. Um, so we'll post this on our website. We'll have a Q and A um, document for, um, along with the chat and the recording, and we'll answer the questions that have come through that we're not able to get to today or we don't have the specifics available to you today. Um, I see a couple more questions. Will these slides be shared? Yes. Um, have there been any discussions about expanding cow and benefits for adults? I know they were recently expanded. Um, kind there of tangent to this, but. There haven't been any additional conversations, at least related to the waiver about um, expanding benefits for Calum adults. There is a separate um, you know, group of folks working on Healthier Oregon. So the expansion of um, OHP benefits to um, 
people who are non-residents. And so some of the Calum expansion, I think, has been occurred over in, in those discussions. Thanks, Lori. And I see Hillary has her hand up again. Anyone else who's also interested in asking a question, please raise your hand. Hillary Nichols. Yeah, hi again. Um, I just wanted to, you know, I, I just really appreciate this, this the slide that's up around meaningfully engaging um, OHP members and community partners. And I'm going to keep beating the drum for um, the OHP coverage before people leave custody. I just spoke with a patient today for whom that would have been super huge if that was available to them. And I was also talking to one of our pharmacists who was saying, hey, isn't that a thing where your Medicaid uh, insurance is suspended? And yeah, I have a patient that um, is, you know, was released in August and is still dealing with having, uh, you know, trying to re-enroll and, and all of that. So, um, you know, I, I know we're on the same page on this piece um, and yet there's all of the, um, you know, everything we just talked about around, um, you know, some of the uh, hesitation for just saying, yes, absolutely, let's let's do that from um, CMS. But um, yeah, I guess in, in, in the spirit of the um, slide that you have up, like, how can um, we, uh, whether that's us at Richmond or other people on this call, um, particularly support um, that piece moving through because um, it's just so, so important. Um, you know, we've been doing our part to meet with um, legislators and tell them why it's important, um, why this issue is important and how it connects to obviously the Medicaid Reentry Act. Um, and yeah, hearing that, you know, the, the work will continue in 2023. Um, you know, what, what can you say today about how um, we can be supportive of this particular piece moving forward? Yeah, no, that's a good question. Um, I think really we're just going to have to keep in contact um, in terms of, you know, um, there may be a real opportunity to provide some additional stories to, to um, CMS. I will say the, the administration supports the idea for sure. So they don't really need to be convinced, but they do need some, um, you know, we we have been working to create a sense of urgency to get the to get the approvals through. Um, so we will just have to um, stay close in terms of keeping information about if we get stuck somewhere and how we might be able to un unstick the policy and keep it moving forward. And appreciate that help. We have a question, Lori, around how does this. How does this dovetail, if it does, with CCO contracting? Will CCO renewals um, for contracts be every five years? Can you talk about how this relates to CCO contracting? Yeah, so CCO contracts will we'll have to make contract changes in the spring like normal. <laughs> um, and in the, that contract change, there will be um, changes related to the health related social needs for 2024. Um, so that'll include network requirements. Um, we will be paying for these services with you know, federal money in, your, in 2024, 25, 26. And we will be using um, non-risk non payments to CCO so that we can get a handle on you know, how much um, uptake there is, what the expenses are, and that sort of thing, um, that'll be in contract. So work underway to start making those contract changes. Um, CCOs will still be contracted every five years. There is a planned, some level of procurement. I think that's still being discussed in the agency about what the next round of CCO um, contracts is going to look like. So more to come, that's to happen for 2025. Thanks, Lori. There's a question about um, the state mental hospital. Can you please speak if folks in the state mental hospital are covered during their stay and if there are plans, also plans for transitions for those patients? So um, people who are in the state hospital are not covered under Medicaid while they are um, in the hospital. So that is true for all people who are justice involved 
um, meaning jail, county facilities, both youth and adult, Oregon Youth Authority, Department of Corrections. Um, CCO benefits are suspended for all of the, I mean, um, sorry, Medicaid benefits are suspended during a person's incarceration. That's federal law. So, and that's why we need a waiver to change it, um, to, to waive that. Um, so for a person who's in state hospital, their benefits are suspended. They, and it can take, like Hillary was mentioning, and we are working on improving this, but it, it can take a while for benefits to come back on. And so one of the important things we wanna do is, is limit that, but then also provide what we've asked for with state, um, um, what we've asked for, for the state hospital is that a member would have limited coverage for 90 days before they're released um, so that that member can you know start to work with uh, navigator to make to make their move out to the community more seamless thanks Lori. um there's a, a comment slash question in the chat about having enough providers um, I am concerned that there are not enough providers to care for all the Oregonians will be, who will be covered as this happened in the past couple of years. People were approved for Medicaid medical benefits, but there were not enough providers available. Yeah, I mean, I, um, yes, that is a real problem. And it's, and it's a very severe problem right now across Oregon for all sorts of medical care. Um, the waiver doesn't address the provider shortage issue. I think there's other areas, both through the legislature and the Oregon Health Plan, I mean, um, in the Oregon Health Authority around addressing the provider shortage. Um, so I don't have answers here, but I do have the acknowledgement that it's, it's um, a big problem. An earlier question was around uh, the formulary. Um, was the formulary in the waiver an open or closed formulary? Um, I believe that was a closed formulary, but that we, like I said, that's not being pursued with the waiver any longer. Thanks. So I will answer the question about the state hospital. Um, not all people are court ordered to be there. Um, some and some are ordered by the court for a period of time until they can stand trial. Others um, are civilly, you know, have other commitment levels. So it's a, it's a range. Okay, just scanning to see if anyone has their hand raised. I don't see any hand raises. Other questions in the chat, Lori, were around um, the housing navigation services and if there are any kind of limitations to that benefit, like the six month uh, limitation to the utility assistance. Um, so I one of the things that we will be working on, and I know um, that, for example, when HealthShare implemented this in the Portland metro region, there was lots of work on a screening tool. Um, we will be doing the same, like, you know, my fingers crossed that we have um, a statewide screening tool, or at least that CCOs will have, that in regions there will be just one. Um, that will help determine a member's needs. So example, someone's leaving, um, or a kid's aging out of foster care, uh, they would be screened for needs and they can receive services. If there's not a hard limit, like six months, they could receive services for up to a year. But that will depend on the screening and kind of you know what the screener determines their need is. So um, it'll vary by individual. And they likely, let's say someone gets six months of services and then they need those services again, um, you know, they can be rescreened if they and so, um, but we will be working out more of those details, but it will be based on a on a screening for need. So uh, 
um, I'm doing one last call for uh, one or two more questions. Um, otherwise, I think we will wrap. Uh, the information about the waiver renewal website and our waiver renewal email is on our last slide here. Uh, please go to our website. As I said, we're going to um, post the recording of the meeting today. We're going to um, post the questions and answers from the chat. We're going to um, also post the chat itself. So we'll have a, a, a printout of all the questions as well in the chat. And it looks like Beth Jackson has their hand raised. Beth. Yes, thank you. Um, I'm Beth Jackson with the Office of Aging to People with Disabilities. And I noticed when I put a comment in the chat, I some other um, organizations seem to have a similar question um, specific to them. But in terms of existing programs that help with housing, is the intention to basically fill in the gaps if those existing programs are not meeting the needs of these consumers? Or how is the coordination of all that going to happen? Because I, I know community organizations are are concerned that you know perhaps it would keep them from being able to do their services and then some of us are aware of programs that are already in existence yeah no that's a really good question so uh, from the federal perspective um this these benefits were allowed um but we had to guarantee that for example that there's no what's called what we call supplantation and what that means is that we wouldn't supplant like use these new services to supplant or override other services so they are exactly what you mentioned intended to fill in gaps um and and um that means that you know we do we absolutely want to work with existing programs and existing providers um and use these temporary rent assistance to kind of fill in gaps for folks until they can get connected with those other providers. Um, and, and so that that's the intent of it. Thank you, very helpful uh, for me and I'm sure for others. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for asking. Thank you so much, Beth, for your question. And I think we're going to conclude for today. I thank everyone for joining us, um, Lori for presenting, and all the folks behind the scenes for making this happen and run smoothly. Please put your questions into the chat. Um, we'll be sure to answer any questions that um, are in the chat and again, post those to the website so you can see um, answers to your questions. And thank you everyone, really appreciate the engagement. Thank you so much.